Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast-growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now, here's your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre. Hello, and welcome to the Business Infrastructure Show, where we share tips and resources to help you cure back office blues. I'm your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre, and helping me kick off Season 5 today is Roger Nirenberg, and it's truly an honor to be joined by him. Roger had lengthy tenures as the music director for the Stamford Symphony Orchestra in Connecticut and the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra in Florida. His guest conducting credits include many of the great American orchestras and opera companies, as well as major music festivals around the world. Roger has recorded with the London Philharmonic, been featured on the BBC's Money Program, as well as PBS's NewsHour. His book, Maestro, A Surprising Story About Leading by Listening, published by Penguin Books, received the honor of Best Leadership Book of 2009. As a fan of classical music, I am so fascinated by what Roger does, and you'll soon found, find out why. You see, this season is all about our guests sharing the one thing they feel we need to know about a particular topic and explaining it to us from a business infrastructure pers perspective. And today, Roger is going to share the one thing we need to know about organizational agility. So without any further ado, Roger, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thanks so much, Alicia. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Now, let's get right into it. The name of your company is The Music Paradigm. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, the music paradigm is a learning experience for organizations. Uh, I have many clients, and they, they range from huge multinational Fortune 100 companies to smaller organizations. And it generally uh, takes place during one of their meetings. At a particular time slot, they walk into a room, and they discover that the first thing they see is the room is not set up the way it usually is. And then as they look a little bit carefully, more carefully, they see their music stands there. And eventually there are musicians and their chairs are amongst the players in the orchestra. So they're sitting with them. And then I get introduced and I lead them through a 90 minute kind of tour of the orchestra. But the tour is, is um, full of not only demonstrations, but also kind of role-playing exercises for the musicians, which are spontaneous. The orchestra is not prepared for what I'm going to ask them to do. So, so they can tell, they, pretty, pretty quickly, the audience can tell that this is not rehearsed. And, and therefore, it has a kind of, a, um, uh, it's disarming because it's so obviously real. And and what I've done is in advance of this meeting, I've consulted with the organization to find out what their ambitions are and why they're holding the meeting, what a success picture would be like, and also what are the challenges that are facing them, what's holding them back. And the role play exercises that I, that I designed for the, for the players uh, are designed to grow spontaneously in the orchestra the same organizational issues that are alive in the client organization. So in more and more, as, as the session goes on, people begin to realize that listening to the orchestra is like looking in a mirror and seeing themselves. And it turns into seeing themselves as they wish they could be, but also seeing themselves in ways that they don't want to acknowledge that they are. But because we're not really talking about the organization at all, and we're not really talking about business issues. We're talking about professionals working together. Uh, nobody gets defensive about seeing their foil, foibles played out on a large scale like this. And so the learning is very deep. It's, as I said, very authentic. Uh, and it makes a big impression. And it really advances the, the agenda of my clients in terms of bringing about organizational change. And that's amazing to me that all of that can be accomplished in a 90-minute session. That's truly amazing. 
Well, it is amazing. Uh, but, you know, music, the reason we do music, first of all, because I'm a musician, but second of all, because music, things happen in music very fast. So the same kind of behavior that might take place a week in, with an orchestra, it takes a couple of seconds. So I announce what the role play is going to be. And then the musicians play and instantly the behavior is connected to the results. So you can see what that behavior causes. Whereas hmm. in real life, it's not so clear. Uh, but here it's crystal clear. So in this magical world where we are, people find it a lot easier to connect the dots about what's going on in their professional lives than it is in real time. And that's part of the reason that so much can be accomplished. Wow. Now, in terms of organizational agility, which is what I know you're going to, to be talking with us about today, can you first define what organizational agility is? Well, I won't give you a definition, but I'll give a description. Okay, uh, even better. Yeah. The world is changing, and the world is changing faster and faster for many reasons, but largely because we're so connected and uh, because the communication is so fast, so amazingly fast, so that the way things are last year, it may not be this year. And the very same behavior that was very competitive and very state-of-the-art could be actually dysfunctional because it doesn't address the new circumstances in the world. I'll just spell it out a little bit more clearly in an obvious way. Let's say you have a client and you're supplying that client and they're a huge client of yours and they, they want things delivered in a particular kind of way, but things change for them and now they dictate to you that's not how we want it delivered. We want it delivered in this way. And so your whole supply chain has to readjust. Everything has to readjust. Mm -hmm. uh, that's organizational change. Uh, it's the, an organization's uh, organizational agility. It's or, an organization's ability to, to quickly adapt to new circumstances and reorganize itself to be able to be relevant in the new circumstance. Was that, was that clear? Yes, very. And it, it, the word that keeps popping up for me, aside from agility or just being agile, is, is also being lean and not having an overly complicated organizational structure so that you can be as nimble and flexible as possible. Yeah, because, because you know, we live in a competitive world and the organizations that, that do things faster and that do things uh, more efficiently and more accurately uh, are the ones that get ahead. Uh, yes. So therefore, organizational agility is not just a nicety, it's really, it's part of survival. Mm. Absolutely. Now, in your opinion, based on the work that you do, what is the one thing that you think we need to know about organizational agility? Well, I don't know whether I can figure out the one thing. If you had I'll, to just pick one thing to, to take a kind of deep yeah. dive on, what, what would that be? Uh, I would say that the leaders of the organization should not be blind to the competencies and capabilities of the workforce. Mm. Because um, it's very easy to focus on the things that you tell the workforce to do and that you measure and that you know is part of the success. But that may be just a part of the skills that your people have. And if you reduce them into simply following the directions that the directions that come from you, then what you'll be doing is blocking out their ability to find ways to get things done faster uh, and more efficiently and more accurately. Because the leader sits in one world you know, at the top of the pyramid, the workforce sits, in what will I call it, the, the leader sits on the podium, the, the, uh, the workforce sits in the chairs of the orchestra, and the world in the chairs is different. The reality in the chairs is different. And when leaders are blind to that reality, 
that blindness, uh, it slows down the ability to innovate, in addition to which it, it, it reduces the initiative of, of the workforce. And all those things, they, that slows down the organization. It slows down the, it, it, it numbs their eagerness to, uh, to do things better. Hmm. Instead, they do things the way they're told. That is powerful. Very powerful statement. Now, if we could attempt to tie this or link this somehow to business infrastructure, and for those who are listening to this show for the first time, business infrastructure is simply a system for how you link your people, your processes, and your tools to ensure growth in a profitable and sustainable way. So, Roger. Now, that's a good definition. <laughs> Thank you. Now, if when it comes to again organizational agility and if we could speak as as broadly and generically as possible if if we can when it comes to the people obviously there's the leadership as you as you've been talking about as well as the workforce that you've been describing what are some processes that you can think of that if you're trying to talk about having a company that is very agile what are some key processes that you can think of that an organization should have in place? Well, I don't know whether this is a process, but if you want agility, then organizational transparency is really important, which means that if you imagine, let's say, all of your workers in one particular office and they're all in little cubicles and they're blind to what's going on in the next cubicle, and everybody's doing their work, but they're blind to each other. Contrast that to a, a place, a, a workplace in which people are aware of what's going on. And so because of that transparency, uh, they see connections that enable things to be done more quickly. Uh, they cross boundaries with, uh, uh, with more confidence because they have an awareness of what the organizational strategy is, and they act supporting that strategy rather than just following the particular direction that they've been given. So I would say organizational transparency is key if you want more agility. Got it. Now, in terms of tools, and, and I know that's probably not a a fair question, but one of the things that's coming to mind for me as I listen to you speak is, you know, obviously communication is so important. And I know there are a, a lot of tools out there to help facilitate more instant type of communication. So there are tools like Slack. Uh, a lot of people are, are using social media uh, and being able to have private messaging within uh, different social media accounts just to be able to have that very quick, on-the-spot, spontaneous, fast, instant communication that you were talking about um, earlier. Are there any other tools that you would recommend to help a company achieve this organizational agility? Well, when people can see the work that other people are doing, like, you know, the sharing of documents mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, the, the, the attitude, the, the dysfunctional attitude of they don't need to know about this. You know, this only applies to this guy. This applies to this guy. This applies to this woman, you know, and they don't need to know what each other is doing. Then um, uh, that fosters an attitude that encourages the silos and the walls coming up. And even if the technology enables them to share, there also has to be a, an attitude of participating and mm. of curiosity. You want to, you want to encourage curiosity about, about the whole process. And people get lost in their function and, and, and they lose this sense of what the whole picture is about, what, what people call enterprise thinking, and see or enterprise perspective, and seeing how their particular part fits into the whole. I think that's critical. Uh, and that, that attitude really starts from the top because at workforce will not default to that. 
it has to be encouraged. Mm. So instead of looking at the individual slices of the pie, look at the whole pie. Well, of course, you live, you, you have your slice of the pie, and right. you're responsible for it, and you're accountable for it, and it's very important. It is the most important thing. But that, sl that slice of the pie feels different and means something different when you see what the whole pie is. Yes. And you see, uh, leaders get so, uh, they've, how would I put it, they just get so used to seeing their perspective that they, they lose sight of what the whole thing is. And there's a story that comes to mind. There was once a, an incident where I made a, a typical leader mistake, but uh, it was a, a kind of a, a tense moment and a lot had to be done in, in very small time. And there was one musician who I thought was, was not paying much attention because every time I would give a direction, she would be the slowest one to respond. She'd be the last one to have her instrument up on, uh, on her, you know, ready to play. She'd have trouble finding the spot. And at a certain point, I, I gave a little, just a little, um, uh, what would I say? I just, I called her out and uh, it was a little stinging that I did. Um, and a uh, man, was she mad after that <laughs> rehearsal? <laughs> came up to me, don't you dare talk to me in that way. And, and I thought, well, you know, look, you know, I had to wait for you all the time. And what, what I discovered was that there was a fan that was on nearby where she was, and I didn't hear it because it was far away from me. I didn't know. Mm. And it was noisy, and she couldn't hear. She couldn't wow. clearly hear the directions. Now, the, you know... When I told that to somebody, it said, well, why didn't she complain about the fan? But here's the key thing. The default for the workforce is they will not complain. They don't. They hmm. don't feel that kind of empowerment. They don't feel that kind of initiative. Rather suffer and make the best of it. So that's why the attitude is so important that the uh, – that the leader has to has you know a lot of uh, creativity curiosity imagination about what's going on in at that worker's desk and what are those circumstances because it could mean something very different or could it than it does to you it could fall within your blind spot and that's an example of how uh it's so important for the leader to take accountability for the transparency within the organization because you cannot expect the workers to do it. Great stuff, Roger. Now, I, I would love to get your feedback on this. So I have this thought, and it, it's funny because another reason I was so excited to speak with you today is because one of the stories that I have in my book I actually describe business infrastructure really as an orchestra because when you think about it, as the CEO, you are the conductor and you need to listen and pay attention to everyone on your team to make sure that that end result, whether that's a finished product or a particular service that you're providing, whatever it is you're presenting to your customer, needs to appear as harmonious and as well put together as possible. So. Um, that, that was just an analogy that I thought of as I was reviewing your work online. And, and even as I'm listening to you right now, it's, it's just been reinforced. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think it's, it's a, a very good thought. And, of course, many people have had it. It began with, I think, Peter Drucker wrote mm. about it either 20 years, 25 years ago. Uh, when, I do, when I was doing my work, I, I actually wanted to – I want to talk with Peter Drucker and I wrote him a letter and told him about what I was doing and quoted this particular paragraph in which he described the conductor. And he said he'd like to, but he's just, he's just too, too old. And, and he died shortly <laughs> after that. So I, oh, wow. I, 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 I understood that, uh, you know, wow. he, he couldn't do that, but I think that's a great idea, but the analogy is very rich and it's, it's even richer than the way you described it. Uh, because, for example, the way the conductor listens to the orchestra determines whether the orchestra listens to itself, how much interest they have in each other. It really starts from the top. And there's all kinds of behavior that comes from the conductor that enables 
the organization to uh, to realize what it could do. And then the, the you know another aspect of this that most people don't realize is that, uh, and this is this is a very common one with young conductors, is that they get very, very responsible and very energized and very well prepared. And they come in and they, they have a picture of what the orchestra should do. And they, they're deleting the orchestra and asking the, the orchestra to do this. And they can understand with, you know, the, the best orchestras, why they get so turned off. And they turn into a kind of malicious obedience. They they do what you're asking them do, to do to spite you, to make mm. fun of you, because you haven't, you haven't taken advantage of what they have. And the great conductors, they all write about this, how they had to learn to listen to what the, what the workforce is offering and the ideas that they have, and then to, to, to supplement that, but to use that. And especially for the young leader, they don't really think about that. And that's, that type of leadership is not taught. But anybody who is an experienced conductor and has worked with great orchestras knows that that's really important. Hmm. Well, this is a great place to take a break and hear a quick word from our sponsor. And when we come back, I would like to learn more about your book as well as hear about any resources that you could recommend for us to learn more about organizational agility. Today's episode is brought to you by Equilibria, an operations management firm specializing in business infrastructure for fast-growing small businesses. The faster your company grows, the more people you will need to add to your team. Without clarity on what should be done, who should do the work, and when, where, why, and how, your business is guaranteed to miss the mark in customer, employee, and vendor satisfaction. Equilibria can develop a business infrastructure that calms the chaos and provides a recipe for sustainable success. Visit eqbsystems.com today. Mention the Business Infrastructure Podcast for a free 30-minute phone consultation, eqbsystems.com. And we are back with Roger Nirenberg. Roger, before that break, you were telling us about the one thing we need to know about organizational agility and how that kind of connects and ties into business infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book? It's called Maestro, A Surprising Story About Leading by Listening. Yeah, well, uh, many people suggested that I should write about the work that I was doing because it, it, uh, people found it so, so interesting. And, uh, and so uh, I, it took me a long time to figure out how to do it. But I finally managed to write about it by creating a kind of a, a fable. But the fable is, is based in fact, but it's the amalgamation of many client experiences. And it's a story about an executive who um, he's so effective as a team leader and he has such brilliant success that he gets appointed to a new leadership position much higher. But here in this position, he discovers that unlike on his team where he was the best at the skill that he was leading them in, here all of his team members are much better at what they do than he is and know much more about it. And furthermore, They've been with the company longer than he has, and they just don't accept his leadership. Uh, it, has, it, has, it has no traction. He, you know, he, he announces things, they institute things, and things don't change. And then he gets a kind of a warning from his boss that the word in the grapevine is that it's not going well in that division, and it's because of him. And he's completely befuddled because he's only doing the same things that were so successful before, and he really has no idea where to turn. But then he overhears a conversation between his daughter's violin teacher and his daughter, in which the teacher is describing this wonderful leader who's come to his orchestra and is so effective and get these, gets these kind of ordinary, ordinary professional musicians to act like one and and so he, he uh, corners the, uh, the violin teacher and says, what is he, who is this guy? What does he do? And he says, well, you just got to gotta see it. I, I, can't, I can't explain it. So he sits in on a rehearsal with the conductor, and he thinks he's figured it all out. But by the end of the rehearsal, he realizes that he doesn't understand it at all, that there's something very special going on there, but he, 
he can't understand it. So he asks to, to talk with the conductor. So the, the following chapters begin with there's some kind of uh, organizational and leadership challenge that is, he, he doesn't know what to do with at work. He goes to rehearsal. He watches the conductor rehearse the orchestra. And then the conductor does things that he finds very counterintuitive and counter to what, what he thinks leadership ought to be. So then he talks with the conductor, and the conductor explains his ideas about why, for example, it's not always the best idea to tell people what to do. Uh, he can't understand. He says, what's wrong with telling people what to do? The conductor says, well, yes, you can tell people what to do, and they will do it, and you will get results, but they will never be the best results. Um, mm. And over the course, so there are a number of chapters like that, and over the course of the book, he completely changes his understanding of what makes leadership effective, and it all is based on, on the ideas the, the conductor is teaching him. That's the book. Wow. So make sure you pick up a copy of that for those of you who are listening. Is, is that available on Amazon? It is, certainly. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Now, do you have any other resources that you can share with us where we can learn more about organizational agility? Well, there's my own website, which is musicparadigm.com. And on that, there are blogs that I write. And as a matter of fact, an incident with the violinist with the fan, uh, mm -hmm. there's a blog about that. Uh, and they're, they're uh, you know, I think that I certainly write about organizational transparency. So they're on my own blogs. And there are other things. There are videos and, and resources on that website. Beyond that, there's all the books that I've read. And, you know, there's, I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Because in the course of, of my work, I'm, I'm meeting a lot, of, uh, a lot of thinkers about organizational uh, dynamics and I'm, I try to inc learn as much as I can and incorporate them. So, um, Can you think I, of maybe two or three like books or professional memberships? or? Well, for example, like I was talking today with a colleague about a book by Ron Heifetz called Leadership Without Easy Answers. And mm. I, I wrote a blog about that. And I'll say just a couple of words about it. He talks about the difference between two types of leadership challenges. One is what he calls a technical challenge. And in th that kind of challenge, let's say, you know, your car breaks down and what you need is you need to find an expert who can fix that. And you find the right expert and that expert does the job. And there are a lot of challenges like that. But there are other kinds of challenges where there is no obvious answer. It's a real problem. It has to be dealt with. But there's nowhere you can find out how to do it. And it's not something that one person can solve. It requires a lot of people adapting to a new reality. And he talks about that and what are the leadership behaviors that work in that situation. Uh, so I read that quite a while ago, and I found that uh, incredibly useful. Another book is uh, this classic by Peter Senge, the uh, fifth discipline, which is about systems thinking, about mm. seeing, seeing organizations as living systems rather than a kind of machine model in which, you know, if you put all the parts together, the machine works. But this is more like the, uh, uh, in which the whole acts differently than the sum of the parts. For example, like with acupuncture, if you have some if a, a pain or a dysfunction presents in one place, you don't necessarily go to that place to fix it. You go to some other place in the whole system and stimulate the system. And the system, it organically takes care of that. So I think about that a lot and I use that in my conducting. And many people think about that uh, with regard to um, uh, to organizations and leading organizations. Uh, now that, that's, this is great. Um, I'll definitely make sure we get links to all of these books as well as your website and in particular your blog on our website. How can people get in touch with you? 
Uh, I'm thinking of another note, another book. Oh, oh sure, sure, please. The more the merrier. A wonderful writer that I met uh, named Jennifer Garvey Berger. Okay. And uh, she wrote one book called Changing on the Job. Uh, and another, which is uh, Simple Habits for Complex Times. And I've read them both. And there's a new one, which I think is uh, Underlocking Leadership Mind Traps, which I haven't read. But she's a great thinker and a very, very good writer. So I'm glad that I, I could include her. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I knew this would happen. We're running out of time. <laughs> There's so much more that could be said. But I am just so grateful and appreciative that you took some time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Now, before we wrap up, how can people get in touch with you? Well, that's the easiest thing. You go to the website, which is musicparadigm.com, mm -hmm. and there's one heading which is called Contact, and there you can directly send me an email. Okay, perfect. Well, Roger, thank you so much for being on the show. Please stay on the line. Um, I'm just going to kind of wrap some things up. Now that you've heard from Roger, don't you agree that his work is absolutely fascinating? You'll definitely want to go to his website because he has a lot of videos on there, and you can actually see what he's been describing during this interview. It's, it's amazing. Now, is there something that he said that resonated with you? If so, how are you going to apply that? to your business. As a reminder, Roger told us that the one thing we need to know about organizational agility is that leaders should not be blind to the competencies and capabilities of their workforce. As the leader, you can block ways to do things more efficiently without even realizing it. And when you do that, it slows down your ability to innovate. This actually can numb your workforce's eagerness to innovate. Transparency, he told us, is so important. And remember, just because people sit next to each other, let's say in cubicles, it doesn't mean that they actually know what each other does. They can still be blind to what is going on throughout the rest of the organization. One way to combat this is to make sure that you have as much transparency embedded in the day-to-day -day operations as possible. That includes sharing documents, having an attitude of sharing, so that people can be curious about the whole picture. As a leader, don't have that tunnel vision. Those blind spots can come back to haunt you. If you want to learn more about Roger and how he can help your company with organizational agility, definitely reach out to him at his website. It's musicparadigm.com. Make sure you click on the contact page and fill out the form. Click that submit button and you will officially be in communication with him. As a reminder, we will have links to all of the resources, the books, as well as Roger's book and website and his blog that he shared in today's interview. We'll have all of that information in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. Did you know that we also have a YouTube channel? Yes, that's right. You can now find this show on YouTube. You'll also be able to find a link to the channel at businessinfrastructure.tv. So make sure you go there, subscribe, and click that notification bell so that you'll know when the next episode airs. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues with Alicia Butler-Pierre. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and subscribe, leave a rating and review, and more importantly, share with your colleagues and team members who could benefit from the information. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.